Our next presentation will be the 2020 Conference for Food Protection Panel Discussion. Collectively, this panel consists of the individuals that served in these roles for the 2020 CFP that concluded last month. The moderator and alternate FDA representative for Council One is Commander Jessica Otto, U.S. Public Health Service. Council One Chair, Ann Johnson, Quality Assurance and Training Specialist with the Florida Department of Agriculture. The issue submitter, Lisa Campbell, Director of External Affairs at Mars Pet Care. Council One Regulatory Member, Adam Inman, Assistant Program Manager at the Kansas Department of Agriculture. Council One Industry Member, Tracy Mickelson, Manager of Restaurant Food Safety, McDonald's Corporation. Jessica, I'll hand it over to you. Great, thank you so much, Tristinda. So welcome. Um, this panel discussion is going to focus on the Conference for Food Protection, or as we like to call it, CFP. Um, there are a lot of registrants at the seminar this year who have, may have never heard of or have been involved with CFP, or might just be curious about how changes to the food code and program standards happen. So we've gathered several panelists to discuss the importance of CFP, how it impacts the food code and retail program standards, how CFP works, and how you can get involved if you'd like. We'll have several polling questions throughout the presentation and an opportunity for questions and answers at the end, and we hope you enjoy the presentation. Next slide. So here's just a brief outline of what we'll do. We'll get a little background about CFP itself. Um, we'll actually be walking through an issue as it went through the CFP proceedings this year to give you a flavor for what CFP is like, um, along with some perspectives from the constituent groups, um, how the issue gets amended and how the councils come to resolution and the um, authorities and, and functions of the Assembly of State Delegates. And then we'll talk a little bit about the post-CFP process and how you can get involved. And then we'll answer Q&A. Next slide. Okay, so background, next slide. Before we can talk about the conference for food protection, or like I said, CFP, um, we have to introduce the two governing documents really at the heart of retail food safety. Um, these two documents provide guidance and direction for the retail food program and are developed and maintained by FDA. And those documents are the FDA Model Food Code and the Voluntary National Retail Food Regulatory Program Standards, or as we like to call them for short, short program standards. Um, the Food Code represents the FDA's current thinking and best advice for a uniform system of provisions that address the safety and protection of food um, offered at retail. Um, it's evidence-based, it examines benefits, costs, risks, and consequences. Um, we look at all of those it, collectively um, before we put provisions in the code. And it's really developed to be available to be uniformly adopted as a statute, regulation, or ordinance for the retail food service and vending segments of the food industry. Um, all 50 states have adopted some version of the food code, and we issue a full edition every four years and a supplement every two years. Um, the Voluntary National Retail Food Regulatory Program Standards, or again, we're just going to call them program standards, um, really define what constitutes a highly effective and responsive regulatory program for retail food safety. Um, really, at its heart, um, it provides a foundation and a system to build upon that all regulatory programs can use as a continuous improvement process. And the program standards encourage regulatory agencies to improve and build upon their existing programs. So together, these two documents provide guidance um, for the retail food safety um, across the nation. And they're fundamental to many jurisdictions, industry, consumers, um, researchers, and as you can imagine, um, setting national level public health policy is a really daunting task. So um, that's why we have the Conference for Food Protection. Next slide, please. The Conference for Food Protection gets 
together federal, state, local, tribal, territorial governments that are primarily responsible for setting food safety standards and many other organizations that share a stake in carrying out the enforcement of those standards. And it brings them together um, across the food industry, government, academia, and consumer organizations to identify and address emerging problems of food safety and to formulate recommendations. The food code is actually a guidance document. And as I mentioned, it's formulated for adoptance into law or regulation at the state and local level. Um, if it were a federal regulation, it would have to go through the federal register process where we could receive public comment and respond to those comments. Um, but the Conference for Food Protection is actually an open forum where we can have a dialogue with all the constituents to gather that information for a guidance document. Um, the conference itself really seeks to balance the interests of regulatory and industry and provide that open forum for the consideration of ideas from any source. Um, we meet biennially, which is every two years, um, to provide this forum for dialogue. And while the conference itself has no formal regulatory authority, it is a powerful organization that profoundly influences the model laws and regulations among all government agencies and really seeks to minimize the disparate interpretations and implementation of um, retail food safety. Um, CFP has an established memorandum of understanding with the foremost food safety organizations in America, which include, but are not limited to, um, FDA, USDA's FSIS, CDC, and ACTO. Um, and these memoranda recognize the value that the Conference for Food Protection has in the food safety arena. And really at its heart, it's about building consensus so that these changes can be adopted widely and uniformly. Next slide. Oh, we're up to our first poll, and I believe that's going to be over in Passable. Um, just to get a flavor for who we have in attendance and listening today, um, we wanted to know if you have ever attended a CFP. We'll give you some time to answer that. We don't have a fancy timer like the previous presentation. All right, we've got lots of results coming in. And this is excellent. I'm glad you all are listening to this panel discussion today because it looks like about 75% of people have never attended a CFP. So um, hopefully this will all be new to you and you can um, better understand the process, how the changes happen over time, and how you can become involved. Thanks. Next slide. So really at its heart, CFP has um, some core objectives. Um, again, we wanna promote food safety and consumer protection through these objectives. So we wanna identify and address problems in the production, processing, packaging, distribution, sale, all the way to the service of food. Um, the focus really is on facilitating food protection programs uh, across the constituent members. Um, it works to adopt sound, uniform procedures, which will be accepted by food regulatory authorities and industry, promote uniformity among the state's territories and District of Columbia, and really promoting mutual respect and trust by establishing a working dialogue among the government agencies, industry, academic institutions, um, professional associations, and the consumer groups that are concerned with food safety. Next slide. The Conference for Food Protection brings together representatives from industry, government, academia, and consumer organizations. We call these the constituent groups. Um, and again, it's really just to look at those issues, identify those issues, and address those issues that are emerging problems in food safety. And that can be at any level. Um, and we have regulators, um, as I mentioned before, from state, local, tribal, and territorial entities. We have industry folks from food service, retail food, food processing, vending and distribution, and industry of support. Um, we have academic groups from universities and institutions conducting independent research. Um, and we also have consumer advocacy groups. And really, it provides individuals a voice in the food safety standards development process. Um, and each of these members can join committees, which we'll talk about later. Um, and really come together to debate those issues that are brought 
to the conference approved protection. And those issues can be submitted by anyone who has an interest or concern about food safety. And the members um, volunteer um, on one of the three councils that makes up um, the conference review protection. And I believe that's on the next slide. So here's our organization. There is an executive board. Um, it consists of 23 voting members. There's three federal, six states, six local, and they're all geographically dispersed. Um, there's six industry, one consumer, and one academia um, representative on the, the um, executive board. Um, there are also 13 non-voting members, which include the past conference chair, um, the program chair, the issue and constitution bylaws chairs, executive director, and treasurer. Um, and assistants and council um, chairs and vice chairs make up this executive board. And they oversee all the proceedings and um, just making sure that all of the business of the, the conference review protection happens over that two-year biennium. And then um, for the actual issue deliberation the, and the committee work, it's separated into three councils. So council one is all about laws and regulations. Council two um, works on administration, education, and certification. And council three works on science and technology issues. And each of these councils consists of 22 members and it, we'll hear more about the council makeup next. And then um, at its culmination, um, all those issues um, come through the committees and the councils. Um, councils make resolutions, and then it goes to the Assembly of State Delegates. Um, and the Assembly of State Delegates um, consists of delegates who are registrants of the conference who represent a state territory or the District of Columbia. Um, they're food regulatory agency responsible for the enforcement of food laws and regulations. Um, and the assembly considers and votes on actions recommended by the council. Next slide. So this process is a continual process and it spans over a two year time frame that really never ends. Um, and it's a fantastic way to get involved in food safety issues, bring issues to light, have consensus de development across constituent groups and really just make thoughtful, um, changes to both the food code and the program standards to move retail food safety forward. Um, next, we're going to hear from our first panelist, um, Ann Johnson, and she's going to discuss the councils themselves in more depth. Ann, over to you. Okay, next slide. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, so all of those issues that are submitted um, go to the issue committee. And the issue committee and the council chairs and vice chairs determine which issues will be assigned to each of the three councils. The councils are seated at the biennial meetings to provide forums for deliberating the issues that have been assigned to them. Uh, each council consists of 21 voting members, which includes the council chair, who will only vote in the case of a tie. In addition, each council also has several non-voting members, including a vice chair and assigned consultant from each of the three federal agencies, which are CDC, FDA, CIFSAN, and USDA, FSIS, a scribe, a parliamentarian, one or more app liaisons, because we do use an app, and for in-person meetings, a runner. The council application period to serve on council will open in May or June of 2022, and it'll be open for 30 days. The council application process is very similar to the committee application process, um, which just closed, um, but you are able to list your first, second, and third choice for council. So, if people are interested in multiple councils, they can order those um, by their, their primary focus. The council chairs and the vice chairs select who their council members are going to be from all those applicants. There are many CFP members that do apply for multiple councils. So the leaders from all three councils do work together to select the most qualified applicants for each council. There might be some trading of people going on. Um, and that is because there are several different forms of balance that have to be achieved on each of the councils. So the first um, one of those balances is that there needs to be an equal number of regulatory and industry members. 
Now within the regulatory constituency, balance is also needed between local and state representatives, um, as well as region. Within the industry constituency, representation is needed from the food processing, food service, retail food stores, and food vending sectors. And then council leaders also strive to achieve a balance by having a mixture of experienced and non-experienced non members on the council. Uh, council chairs then submit their selected council rosters to the executive board for approval. And once the roster has been approved by the executive board, then applicants are notified of their selection to serve on whichever council they've been selected for. And those notifications will probably go out in around September of 2022. Councils one and two have a total of nine industry and nine regulatory representatives, one academia and one consumer representative. Due to the scientific nature of council three, their makeup is a little bit different. So council three has five industry and five regulatory representatives, plus up to 10 at large members that are from any constituency in order to assure that there's expertise in science and technology on that council. Each council also has several alternates um, and the council leaders select as many alternates as possible from different constituencies and different sectors within the constituencies. The alternates are considered members of the council and they will be used to replace voting council members whenever the need should arise. Each council uh, begins the biennial meeting by establishing rules. These rules usually include a strict time limit for deliberation and discussion of each issue. So some examples of typical time limits that are set by councils is 20 to 30 minutes total for deliberating each issue. And that would include one minute for the issue presenter and two minutes for each person who wishes to speak on that issue during the discussion and deliberation. The parliamentarians um, duties include keeping track of that time limit. Um, the council can extend time to debate an issue if they have a motion in a second to do so, and it passes by a majority vote. Now, once this council establishes rules at the beginning, uh, then the council proceeds with issue deliberations. So to start issue deliberations, the council chair is gonna read the issue number and title of the first issue, and then recognize the issue presenter to present the issue. And just a note that while anyone can it, uh, submit an issue to CFP, uh, you can only present an issue to council if you sign up for the biennial meeting. So you have to be a registered participant at the biennial meeting. And I'll turn it back over to Jessica. You're on mute, Jessica. I hit mute twice, sorry about that. Thank you. Um, so now that you've gotten kind of the low down on CFP, the 30,000 foot view, we're actually gonna walk through an issue. So we'll go to the next slide. And our next few presenters are gonna go over the process in detail and we'll present an issue as it was submitted to CFP this year. So you can better understand the process itself. Um, we'll be looking at issue 2021-28, which was to amend the food code to permit dogs in outdoor dining areas. So we're gonna kick it off with a poll question. So we'll go to the next slide and there should be a poll in Passable. Just to see if anyone on the call today has actually submitted an issue to CFP. And we'll give you just a little bit to answer that poll. Very interesting so far. It looks like we've got about 6% who have issued, um, submitted an issue to CFP. Um, in any given year, um, and again, this is every two years, there's about 100 issues that are submitted. So they are pretty rare, 
Um, and they're well researched. And again, they come from a place of wanting to make a change and bringing to light an issue in, in food safety. So very interesting that 7% 7, 7 now, 8% of folks on the line have submitted an issue. So hopefully this won't be new to you, but for everyone else, hopefully you'll enjoy us running through an issue. So we'll go to the next slide. And Anne already mentioned that when we're at CFP, the issue um, submitter only has one minute at the microphone to be very concise and present their case. Um, everyone at the council table will have already received a copy to look at and consider, um, along with anybody who's a member of CFP can access these. Um, but the issue um, presenter themselves only has one minute at the microphone. We're going to be kind today, and we're going to give our issue submitter three minutes to, to give us the lowdown on this issue. So Lisa, we're gonna um, kick it over to you to tell us about the issue you submitted. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lisa Campbell, and I'm the Director of External Affairs for Mars Pet Care. And you may know Mars for some of our iconic confection products like M&Ms, Twix, Snickers, and Skittles. But you might not realize that we're also the world's largest pet care company with pet nutrition brands like Pedigree, IAMS, and Neutro. And we're the leading veterinary healthcare provider with more than 2,000 veterinary hospitals. Over the last year and a half, the importance of pets has become overwhelmingly clear. In a 2020 survey of pet owners, we found that 86% said that their pets offered them companionship, 78% said they helped them have less stress and anxiety, and nearly 70% said they gave them a sense of hope during a time when it was hard to find that anywhere else. So for these reasons, I'm thrilled to join you all today to share our experience presenting our issue, seeking to amend the model food code to permit dogs in outdoor dining areas. As we looked at the past two decades, we learned that 22 states and the District of Columbia have all implemented policies allowing pets, pet dogs in outdoor dining areas. And among those 23 jurisdictions, there are significant differences in policy. Some states allow restaurants with an outdoor dining area to permit pet dogs, but others impose specific sanitation, signage, or hygiene requirements. And still others require restaurants to obtain a variance from the state health department. We submitted this amendment to create one standard policy in the model food code in an attempt to bring an end to this confusing patchwork of policies that currently exists. The submission is based on best practices from states with existing policies, and it also incorporates insights from a recent risk assessment developed by government agency Food Standards Australia New Zealand. That risk assessment determined that with proper sanitation requirements, the risk of disease to humans is very low to negligible when dogs are allowed in outdoor dining areas. Our submission suggests amending the model food codes prohibiting animal section to allow restaurants to admit dogs to outdoor dining areas, provided that the pet is under its owner's control, the restaurant uses separate single-use disposable containers when providing food or water to the dog, and the area is kept clean. Implementing this amendment would grant restaurants across the country the flexibility to allow pet dogs in outdoor dining areas while also giving them the clarity of one central policy that will ensure they can maintain food safe practices. The amendment would also allow restaurants to embrace the growing trends of pet owners integrating their pets into everyday activities at a critical time. Over 23 million households welcomed a new pet during the COVID-19 pandemic alone. So now is the time for a national policy allowing dogs in outdoor dining areas. And our submission would allow restaurants to welcome pet dogs without compromising the safety of patrons. We're encouraged by this process, allowing the opportunity to submit into the next model food code, and we're hopeful to see our submission passed. Thank you so much, Lisa, for presenting that issue. Um, for those who are gonna be accessing the presentation, um, that issue is hyperlinked at the top of the slide. Um, and again, anyone can access the issues as they were submitted. Um, through foodprotect.org, which is the CFP website. So now that Lisa has introduced us to the issue that was submitted, we'll go to the next slide. 
and you simply ask, has anyone ever brought your dog with you to an outdoor dining area? And while you're answering that, again, really as we kick off the CFP deliberation process, that issue is submitted, it is um, presented, and then it's incumbent upon each council member to bring their perspective, which is what we're gonna segue into next, to the discussion to see if it makes it into the food code or program standards, or if a committee needs to be formed. So it looks like we've got almost 30% of folks on the line who have brought their dog with them to an outdoor dining area. All right, next slide. We're gonna go back to Anne and she's going to um, help us understand how the debate proceeds from here once the issue has been presented. Thank you, Jessica. So CFP uses an amended version of Robert's rules of order for all of their meetings, including the council sessions. So in order to begin deliberations or discussion, a motion has to be made from one of the voting council members. So the council chair will entertain a motion to either accept the issue as submitted or to take no action on the submitted issue. Once one of those motions and a second for that motion has been made, then the issue is open for discussion for the council. Now, only the issue number, title, and recommended solution is displayed for council deliberation. It is expected that all council members to come to the, count, the biennial meeting uh, fully prepared for discussion by reviewing all of the issues, the submitted documents, any attachments that are with the issues, uh, before they get there. So again, only the recommended solution, the title and issue number will be shown. And then only the recommended solution itself is deliberated by the council, unless the issue has a content document attached and CFP does have a definition of what a content document is. This did not have a content document. Any CFP member can speak to an issue um, to the council during discussion of issues, the council chair will recognize members of the council first, then the issue submitter, and then those that are in the audience. Council members can also request that an audience member be recognized instead of using their speaking time themselves to speak to the issue. And then council members or audience members um, have to be recognized by the council chair in order to speak. During deliberations, changes to the recommended solution might be offered. Uh, by a voting council member. It happens quite often, actually. And this can only be done when the motion on the table is to accept the issue as submitted. The offered changes would be referred to as friendly amendments. So for example, if a voting council member wanted to remove the word disposable in 6G uh, B uh, G there, um, that would be a friendly amendment that the person who made the original motion would need to accept. And then the proposed recommended solution could be changed many times during the discussion and deliberation. There might be a lot of friendly amendments, that happens a lot. Um, but all amended language does have to pass by simple majority vote. Uh, but it is the goal of the council to come to a consensus so that everybody or at least the majority of council members are all on the same page. So now I'll turn it over to Adam Inman and he can provide a regulatory perspective for this particular issue. Thanks, Anne. I think we're ready for the next slide. Because this is gonna be a good slide, it says perspective. So that way you know what we're, what we're giving here. But I'll, I'll speak from my regulatory perspective on the council and it was a really interesting experience and I, I just had such a great time and I'm sorry Ann that you had to put up with me and everybody else on the council and, and watching but it, I just loved it to death. But uh, this is an issue you can see in the chat it's blowing up hot button issue. But in I was looking at this over the years and how it's impacted us here in Kansas and the dogs out of the yard, we have to do the pun but the dogs already out of the gate and we just really had to and it was kind of a last opportunity, especially thinking of the timeline of the conference of food protection being a little bit longer scale, that we could try to get some sense of consistency nationally. And so speaking to everyone, 
either you've had this a lot of times presented to you outside of your control or it's coming down the road. And so this might be an opportunity to try to get some consistency nationally. So for us, really, the, the question became, do you do it through a pre-approval or variance type process? Or do you set out some specific listed items in the code that, that folks can comply with to try to set that, that baseline? And so there was actually issue 029 that was right after this. They were grouped together. We considered it together. We felt, you know, Council 1 deals with laws and regulations. And sometimes we did kick some issues over to Council 3 for the science part. But I think everyone was pretty comfortable that the risk for dogs specifically was low enough that that was we were able to carve that out versus say cats with toxoplasmosis or um, you know the salmonella from reptiles and these other things that might be more problematic. So plus service animals obviously are accepted, but for just the pet dogs, this was a specific carve out that could be done. And so we used this straw poll feature, and uh, we were able to finally drill down the fact that we we supported that this needed to move ahead in some fashion, and that probably the best thing for consistency sake was to have a list of rules. And of course, when we got to that point, I think the council, was, we all wanna have it exactly right. And we would get into this level of detail that might take a little bit of time that we didn't really have. So we, we, con we came to a strong majority, I think, of, of folks agreeing that there needed to be some type of list that we could present to FDA for them to start with and say that this issue needed to, to move ahead in, in that kind of fashion and that approach and then trusted FDA is gonna go through their, their part of the process. I think I'm hopeful that the dissenting votes were more of like statement votes that, you know, we really don't want to, to have this necessarily. So I'm gonna go on the record for that. But uh, overall, I think the process was really, really good. So that was my perspective um, from, from a state regulatory program. And um, just love to hear from the, the retail side of things because that was really an enlightening part for me as well. Thanks for that, Adam. Um, and that's a fantastic segue because we're going to go to Tracy Mickelson next, who's going to give us some of the industry perspective on this issue. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so uh, Tracy Michelson, Restaurant Food Safety Manager with McDonald's. Um, this was my first uh, council um, experience. So, and as an industry member, we did spend some time um, discussing this amongst our constituents. So um, I have attended many past conferences as, as attendees and participated in different committees. Um, so it was really fun to be able to come and deliberate and debate on all these different food safety topics. So great, great experience. Um, as you know, the industry consist constituency is mostly made up of retail, food service, and manufacturing companies, man many of which are competitors. Um, but there is one infallible belief within the food industry, and that is food safety is never to be considered a competitive advantage. And if one brand has an issue with food safety, it affects the entire system. So um, we did get together as a group and spend a good amount of time of uh, collaborating and developing ways to improve food safety across the board. And our discussions around the CFP issues were no exception. Um, the industry council members went into the conference aligned on how we were going to respond to each issue including issue 28, <laughs> which I think was very complicated as it was one that generated both professional and personal interest for quite a few members. Um, so I thought it was interesting that our poll um, indicated that there was less people that have taken their dogs to patios than more since most people I talked to um, have. So uh, those of us in the dog loving community desire to be able to bring our fur babies with us when we are out and about. Um, this can pose a challenge when it comes to uh, time to eat and you still have your dogs with you. So, um, or you want to share a socialization experience with them. So I think it is happening. There is the trend, as Adam said, it's, it's coming down the pike um, no matter what. But from an operator perspective, there are a lot of concerns with bring up people bringing their dogs onto their premise. So if I'm thinking about it from a large corporation perspective, like McDonald's, I'm like, mm, our patio is really are like wide open and there's not a lot of stuff going on on them. So maybe from that perspective, not a big deal, um, but maybe more around the mom and pops or more controlled areas where um, there might be some more concerns with it and, and how, how we handle that. So some questions we kind of asked ourselves, you know, in terms of just an, a, a dog being there is like, well, well, how well behaved is the dog? 
you know, um, I did see somebody in chat saying that they didn't really like it when somebody's dog was sitting right next to them. Um, there's a lot of people that are afraid of dogs. Um, how responsible is the dog parent? So we feel in my family that we've got very well trained uh, pets, but um, there are those out there that may not. And then, you know, how will my other customers feel about this, you know, in terms of, of having it there? And then from a food, fit, food safety perspective, we have concerns about how well the operators will follow the requirements and guidelines. So we as a, a corporation or a business can, and, and as, you know, a group, a food safety group can put together tons of requirements and guidelines, but hey, is, is everybody gonna be reading that food code and that list that we provided and know what is required? Or are they just gonna say, okay, I can do it now and just come on in and <laughs> let, it, let it happen. Um, have they educated their staff on proper procedures and practices? So who's cleaning up after the dogs? What happens if the staff decides to pet the dog, which I have seen, um, or what if they decide to do some food prep or storage on the patio, even though we said they can't, they, that, that just sometimes happens. So, also, who is monitoring and coaching on all of these requirements? Um, are we expecting our staff to do that? Are we expecting the managers to be out there? Um, and if there is an issue or complaint, who is going to enforce those rules? So how will the regulatory agency um, enforce these rules? And are we putting a lot of pressure on our operators to, to be able to do that all um, themselves. So we all know what direction it, this is trending in. So an industry agrees with regulatory 100% with Adam and, and, the, and the group that standards and guidance are definitely needed here. Um, our belief is there still will need to be quite a bit of local regulatory involvement required, um, whether that is to communicate, and educate on the code, uh, review and approve plans, and or inspect and enforce compliance. So um, you know, the, the opportunity for things to go wrong, including illness and injury. So I know maybe low, low risk on illness, but even from an injury perspective, um, that need to be taken into account as we move forward on the path to allowing dogs on food service patios. So therefore industry felt it was in the interest of our communities and fellow business operators that we continue to work on better guidance, education, and support outside of the food code realm. So maybe a little something there in the food code, but I think the majority of the guidance and support should, should be you know, outside that food code so we have more flexibility um, to be able to adjust it as needed. Thanks so much, Tracy and Adam. So hopefully that gave you a little bit of a flavor of some of the perspectives that come out during the council deliberations. Um, I did mention earlier, we do have two other very important constituent groups. We don't have them on the panel today, but certainly during the deliberation, especially of this issue, um, the consumer groups and the academia groups had their perspectives and their own support and concerns during the council deliberation. So we just brought these two for today for the sake of um, time, um, but we're gonna keep moving through so you can kind of see how this issue unfolds um, after the council deliberations are complete. So we'll go to the next slide. And we have another quick passable question for you. Does your jurisdiction currently allow dogs in outdoor dining areas? It looks like a lot of folks have been following along and have already answered the poll. Um, right now, we've got about 75% of folks reside in a jurisdiction where um, their jurisdiction does allow dogs in outdoor dining areas. So very interesting. We'll go to the next slide. Um, Anne is going to help us understand um, now what happens with the deliberation and recommendations from council. Thank you. Um, so this did not happen during this, this issue, but I just wanted to bring it to everyone's attention, make you aware. Um, a council can decide during deliberation that it's necessary to refer an issue to a different council. Um, so if it involves science or technology, council one may choose to move the issue to council three um, because they think it would be better deliberated there. Um, so if that happens, the council chair just notifies the issue chair and then the council vice chair works with the issue chair to make sure that the originally submitted issue and the rationale for reassignment to a different council 
is communicated to that new council and that the issue is then moved to them. The new council is the one that determines the final council recommendation. So any work that the original council may have done on the issue um, would be null and void if it's transferred to a different council. So when a council um, decides on a recommendation, they only have three options. They can either accept the issue as submitted, accept it as amended, or take no action on the issue. The final council recommendation has to pass by a simple majority vote. Um, but as I said previously, the council does strive for consensus. Um, so one constituency you know, doesn't just try to push an issue through and get that 51% or 55%. Um, they, they really do strive for consensus. That's a very big part of it. For issue 1-02A, it was accepted as amended by Council 1. The amendments that were made by the Council um, included an option in 6B to physically restrain the pet dog as opposed, it, opposed to requiring it to be on a leash or in a pet carrier. Um, a, they proposed subparagraph 6F um, to be completely rewritten to prohibit dogs from contacting fuels at all. Um, and then they proposed a subparagraph 6H um, that, I'm sorry, that was deleted. Um, and that was because the council felt it was already addressed by the food code. Now the final council recommendations um, are sent to the issue committee chair who then prepares them for the assembly of state delegates. The final council recommendation packet that contains all of the council uh, recommendations for all three councils, all three, all the issues, um, is made available by early evening on the day before the assembly of state delegate um, meeting when that convenes. So the council chairs provide a verbal report to the assembly of state delegates that summarizes their council's recommendations. The final action that is taken by CFP on each of the issues will depend on the vote at the Assembly of State Delegates and the directives that are actually written in the final issue recommended solution. Now this finalized issue that's shown on the screen here, this one indicates that it's already been through the Assembly of State Delegates um, for issue 1028. It was accepted by the Assembly of State Delegates. So they did accept the council's recommendations to accept the issue as amended. And I will turn it back over to Adam to explain the Assembly of Delegates process. Thanks, Anne. Next slide. Yeah, spoiler alert, this one made it through the, the Assembly of State, State Delegates, so it should be headed to FDA for them to consider their next steps. But just to go over the Assembly a, a little bit more in depth, uh, again, it's it's uh, we come together on the last day of the biennial meeting, and we vote on these issues that are sent to us by all the councils. And once it's there, we can't change the council recommendations. We can either accept them or reject them. So the delegates are, again, made up of uh, an authorized representative from a state territory or the District of Columbia. And we represent a food agency uh, responsible for enforcement of food laws. So as y'all are probably aware, there are some states at the state level that are split you know, amongst more than one agency. And so then those votes are split as well to represent the state that way. As an aside, there was an issue on local representation for state delegates. And so that's a, a, a committee that was formed to explore how it might be the best way to get that, that voice through to the, to the Assembly of State Delegates. So keep your eye out for that uh, as that progresses. But uh, as of right now, each state for the Conference of Food Protection has one vote and that's divided equally. Now the six territories in the District of Columbia each have a half a vote. So when we get those issues, we can either accept or reject those recommendations from the council. Um, we can vote on those issues as a block. So they're submitted in blocks and we can either take that block and do the whole thing, lock, stock and barrel one at a time, or we can e extract an issue. So I uh, believe this time it was really a great example of, of consensus across the board. I think there was only one issue extracted that said a state, state delegate in a second said, we really need to have um, some more discussion on this specific issue. We, we, don't, we think maybe something was new or something was missed in the council deliberation. And so that was pulled out. And at, in this case, this, this past biennial meeting, the, the council's recommendation was upheld 
by the majority of the assembly. But uh, it gets a little confusing on the voting sometimes. Sometimes there's some triple negatives. Are you accepting this recommendation, which then leads to no action? So um, if a majority, either simple or two thirds for certain issues of the voting delegates vote yes on issues, accepted as submitted or accepted as amended by a council, the action recommended by the council will be taken. If a simple majority vote no, the council will take no action on the issue. So that's where you start. You might need a flow chart. We all had to have our flow charts and think about what we wanted to do on a specific vote. And we had great help from the FDA parliamentarians. Um, Janet Williams helped us through that process when we got to the assembly again, because it's always a little bit confusing. We don't do it all the time and have to get refreshed. Now, if a simple majority of the voting delegates vote yes on issues, the council took no action on, the conference will take no action on the issue. So we're accepting that recommendation. We're agreeing with that. But if a simple majority vote no, then the issue goes to the executive board for further consideration. So the board gets to decide what they think needs to be the appropriate steps, next steps for that. So um, again, extracted or as a block and in, in this past meeting, only one was extracted. So I thought that, that was really a good representation of, um, of the council's wishes and how good that process went at building consensus. Uh, the two thirds majority, if you recall, I mentioned that the issues dealing with the constitution and bylaws or procedures of the conference automatically get extracted and, and there's some that require a two thirds majority vote just to make extra sure that that's the direction the conference wants to go. So hopefully that, you know, it's a quick, it's complicated. All these documents are available on the CFP's website. You can really dive into it if you want to get more information about it and explore that a little bit further. But uh, for this particular issue that we walked through, you can see it made it through the process and there was consensus that it needed to proceed to the next steps. And so we'll see how that one comes out. Great. Thanks, Adam. And I know we're running short on time, so we're going to go kind of quickly through these next couple slides just so that you can get a flavor for what happens after CFP. So we'll go to the next slide. Next one after that. All right, so when those recommendations come through, um, after they've gone through that entire process, CFP will send a letter to the federal agencies within 45 days with all of the recommendations and what the asks for changes were for both the program standards and the um, food code, as well as committee formation. And then um, SDA has additional 60 days to respond to that letter. Um, and what that response includes is either a concur or a non-concur with the recommendation and a why if there's a non-concur. Um, sometimes additional research is necessary. Sometimes um, additional resources are necessary. Um, so sometimes there will be a non-concur, um, but it's always accompanied with a, an explanation of why. Um, and certainly issues can be resubmitted to the next conference or can be deliberated further in a committee. We'll go to the next slide. And yeah, you can click through all of these. I'm not going to um, bore the pants off of everybody, but just so that you know, when FDA does non-concur, we do have a food policy analysis framework. These slides will be available to you um, after um, the presentation today to give you the five second skinny on it. It aligns FDA with an executive order to make sure that we make purposeful decisions that are science led, but also understand considerations for um, the sensitivities around um, any topic, the resources required, um, whether or not it's enforceable, whether or not it's efficient, whether or not it's the most um, impactful way um, to go about creating a solution by enacting policy. Um, and if not, if you can support it with outreach or education or research or other um, um, action. Um, so I won't go into this in detail, but we do use a five-step process. It is iterative in nature. It is based on an ISO standard. Um, so when FDA does concur or non-concur with any of the issues that come from the Conference for Food Protection for a change to the food code or the program standards, there's definitely a lot of why and how behind it. Um, it's not just done in a vacuum. So we'll go to the next slide. And the last poll you should see in Packable will be whether or not you've seen any of the response letters to CFP. And we'll just kind of leave that open for folks because I know we wanted to have a little bit of time for questions if there's any um, leftover time. So we'll go to the next slide. 
And really, again, that letter is available to you on foodprotect.org, and it um, includes FDA's response to all of the suggested actions from CSP. Um, and just a plug, um, if you want to get involved, there are some amazing committees that do a lot of work in two years, really going through the issues that go to committee to discuss and debate and, again, really get that consensus from all the constituent groups around the important food safety issues on the table. Um, those are listed here for this biennium, and you can get involved by um, becoming a CSP member and um, going to the website. We'll go to the next slide. And if there's any time left over, we'd be happy to entertain your questions. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, panelists. This was a fantastic discussion. Unfortunately, we have run out of time. However, there are about 100 uh, chat questions for the panelists. So please take some time to go into Passable and respond to these questions for the folks. There was a lot of interest. Um, there, a lot of information can be shared that way, so uh, I please would ask if you guys can do that. 